Oh, thank you. Yeah, how many people were here last year at uh, DevOps Days? Just show of hands. So the, the 3D version, you'll notice I'm a little bit taller. They, uh, you know, were budget cuts while printing out the, uh, you know, the old Pete Flatlock. So, um, you know, we had to uh, get one that was a little bit shorter. Uh, what's funny is I've actually never seen it in person. They just took a picture of me, and it's in someone's house right now, which also is a little worrisome, but... Anyway, so we're going to talk, uh, pick any three, good, fast, and safe, and we're going to talk about kind of DevOps from scratch, some of the things that ThreatStack optimized for very early in our growth, uh, and what we continue to invest in today. So who am I? Uh, my name is Pete Cheslock. Uh, I am at Pete Cheslock on Twitter. Um, you can feel free to follow me on Twitter. I um, don't really tweet too much about technology anymore, except for maybe bad technology. I mostly just tweet about uh, smoked meats. Uh, we call it Pete's Meat Tweets. So uh, people say you can't get good barbecue in Boston, and I say you haven't been to my house yet. So um, I do uh, technical operations at ThreatStack. So uh, I've been there for almost four years from before we launched. And um, I'm, like, I'm going to say that that's probably not related to me. But um, So I've been there for about four years before we launched. So a lot of, a lot of this talk is what, what we focused on, the decisions that kind of we made really early. So, um, so the talk title, you've heard it before, right? You can only pick two, good, fast, or safe. It's just not possible to have all three. Uh, or that's what we're led to believe, at least. Um, that in order to move fast, you have to undertake risky behavior in your environment. Or that in order to build something good, um, you know, and secure that you have to move slowly. So uh, again, I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, again, there's one thing to know about me. There's always going to be a unicorn slide uh, in, in my talks. And so I'm here to tell you, I think you can have all three things. I think you can build good infrastructure, you can build it safe, and you can build it quickly and continue to move quickly. I don't think any of these things uh, should really be slowing you down, uh, especially in this modern world. So anyway, you can, you can do all these things. I think if you're in the middle, that's where the unicorn lives. So we did a research study at ThreatStack uh, maybe about six months ago at this point. What we found was you know, a large number of companies are actually choosing um, to, to move fast and sacrifice security for that. And I've worked in a lot of places where that's the case, where um, you know, we got to get this release out. We'll, we'll deal with vulnerability scanning later or other things like that. Um, you know, on the reverse side, you see a lot of sales professionals that say deals actually get slowed down by security requirements. Customers either want specific requirements, and maybe deals get slowed down. So for those of you that have not heard of ThreatStack, any, actually, any ThreatStack customers in the audience? Yeah. ThreatStack is pretty awesome. Uh, it's a tool that we actually use at ThreatStack, which I'll talk uh, a little bit about. Uh, but we, we help companies kind of build uh, a SecOps program in their environment. Uh, how do you move quickly? Uh, how, do you, how do you follow a framework that allows you to uh, you know, kind of improve how you do your, your operations and your security? So um, I think there's open spaces tomorrow. So Love to do a security open space and just kind of hear how people are solving this. So um, uh, who's here at their very first dev DevOps days? First, first timers. Fantastic. Welcome. So I like to make sure that we level set. We've got some kind of noted thought leaders in the audience uh, that already are well experienced on the DevOps. But I like to make sure we're all on the same page. So um, what even is DevOps, right? Is it a tool that you can use or maybe a service that you can have some consultants implement for you? Um, is it software that you can buy? Uh, hopefully that software is concurrent DevOps. Don't come into my house with any of that single-threaded DevOps nonsense. There's like 16 cores on this DevOps. I'm not giving you any more. Is it a job title? How many people here are a DevOps engineer? Don't feel bad. It's all right. Can you be a DevOps manager? Sure. Can you be a director of DevOps? I, I, I was also a director of DevOps. Uh, it happens. There's always a worse title. Just don't forget, there's always a worse title out there. <laughs> I just can't. I'm sorry. So no matter what your title is, it's not as bad as this one. That's all you have to remember. But is it a team? How many people here are on the DevOps team? Bonus points, do you also have an ops team? So I get why it exists. It's a qualifier for sysadmins who can write code, except for the fact that, let's be honest, sysadmins have been writing code for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time, and we wrote code in the early aughts to automate our systems. We used terrible software to do it, uh, but we wrote code. So what is DevOps? It's anything your heart desires, anything you want it to be. I often describe it like Zombo.com. Uh, anyone here not been to Zombo.com? 
Oh, you are in for a treat. So you can't go to Zombo.com anymore because this is Flash. It, it was built in uh, 1999. It was a joke on websites that would have these loading screens. And when you go to it, you just hear this voice say, Welcome to Zombo.com. You can be, the only limit is your imagination, right? And it promises so much. But in the end, it's just some kitschy music and, and some animated graphics. The beautiful thing is someone actually converted this over to HTML5. So you can go to Zombo.com. If you go, turn your volume up, thank me later. If there's one thing you learn from DevOps days, Zombo.com. So let's talk about the bad old days. Uh, so uh, show of hands if you've been in the industry more than five years. So if you keep your hand up, if you're over 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. All right, so you're, a lot of people are going to have some feels in this one. So let's imagine this world. This is my favorite tweet ever. Uh, taking Twitter down for a little nap. The site and message delivery will be back within four hours. Can you imagine this happening today? This date is 2007. Now, we all wish it would happen today. Just <laughs> give everyone just calm the hell down. But it's just not possible in this day and age. You just can't be like, hey, we're going to just turn off Twitter for a while. Twitter isn't the only company this happens to, though. Uh, I was trying to view flight details to get here. And uh, JetBlue's like, oh, sad face. Like, we got to do some maintenance. This was like at 2 in the afternoon. <laughs> so no matter how bad you think you are, the US government has you covered. Hold my beer. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had time to dive into this. It's, it's just amazing. Not only does this planned outage go until December 31st, 1999, um, but then you can, you can do the, like until approximately 640 in the past. This was like from a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah. Anyway, so let's talk about the bad old days of software. So in the bad old days, you had devs would rarely ever have access to production systems, right? You know, they take the code and they hand it off to the ops people and say, you know, hey, ops people, go deploy this. So the ops would have to take this code and deploy it on the dev instructions, which usually was, hey, go deploy that thing. Well, how do I deploy that thing? Well, just take the code. It's self-documenting. So how many changes were in that code? How many changes were there? How was it tested? Is it a week's worth of changes? Was it six months of changes? Um, what about if you do any sort of package software like we used to do in the old days with CDs and floppies? How do you get updates out, right? Service pack one, service pack two, or uh, 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 you know, if you've ever installed software on floppies and you get like the, the tray of like 100 floppies you have to install. So let's talk about the bad old days of infrastructure. You know, systems at this time lovingly hand-built, just artisanal, bespoke systems. And there were sysadmins, much like myself, who were very proud of their system uptimes. Who here was proud to have really high uptime, right? Because that means you're so available. When I think about that, I go, wow, that server's not been rebooted in nine years. There are nine years of software updates that have to happen on this thing. And also, do you want to be the person that has to reboot that? Is it going to come back? You set that ping, and it's like, request timeout, request timeout. And you're sitting at home, and you're like, please, please, please. Oh, there it is. OK, great. So you know, these were huge risks to the business. So in the late aughts, there have been a lot of great conference talks really talking about things like agile infrastructure. So Andrew Schaefer, who's spoken here before, had probably one of the best talks on that at an agile conference. The one that I think really set things off for me personally was the Velocity 2009 conference talk with John Oswald and Paul Hammond. Uh, they came on and they said, we're doing 10 deploys a day. This was 2009. So people were like, what? Like, no, you're not. <laughs> I do 10 deploys a, a year, not a day. That's insane, right? We could barely believe it. So you had this traditional thinking. Dev's job is to add features. And ops job, keep the site stable and fast, which seems correct, right? That's what we do. So then you have this classic wall of confusion, right? One side wants change, one side wants stability. The incentives are not aligned. And when you have these uh, uh, incentives that are not kind of lined up and, and two teams working together, maybe you have some uh, miscommunication issues that turn into, you know, we got it done. We put the trees. We got the sidewalk in, right? It's all good. So let's say you're doing the DevOps now. 
It's 2018. We're doing the DevOps. Everyone's really happy on this side of the wall. You got your devs and your ops people. Um, but security, they're on the other side. They're left behind. Did you include them in your new fancy automated build environment system and everything else? Or are they just basically just barely trying to keep up? So we have the same problem. We've got incentives where the security team's incentives are way different than the rest of the company's incentives. So what happens again when you have two teams that are not working well together? You get something like this, you know, half-baked security solutions. Um, you know, I, I like to call this checkbox security. It's like, look, auditors, we have access control right here. <laughs> they do. So uh, from that velocity talk, it's not the ops job to keep the site stable and fast. It's both ops and the dev's job to enable the business. And this is the thing we always talk about, enabling the business. And they do that by lowering the risk of change through both tools and culture. You can't just have one or the other. You have to improve both the tools and the culture. Because if you have a culture that doesn't support rapid development, and you start bringing in tools that enable that, like you're going to have a really bad time. And if you have, your culture can support all this stuff and you're just using these broke tools, like you're also going to have a lot of problems. And those DevOps transformations are the ones that end up in a lot of pain. So this is a story in three acts. And these are the three kind of specific things that we focused on. Uh, everyone builds off the, the last one. So the very first thing, optimizing for soft, software deployment. Um, taking metrics and making them a first class citizen within our environment and ownership and accountability which is if you're doing DevOps, hopefully you're, you're applying those things as well. So modern operations in a lot of ways is how do I install a thing on a thing, right? How do I install Cassandra on Azure or Kubernetes on AWS, right? You're just installing a thing on a thing um, in a lot of ways. Maybe you're building packages in Debian, maybe you're building Docker containers, whatever. But one of the first things we did at ThreatStack, even before we had, had a real product, was make it very easy for developers to deploy their app. Push button, click deploy. We want it to be super easy because we knew that as we grew in scale, that was going to be something that was going to be a pain point, and we're not going to go fix it under massive scale. So let's solve it right away. Um, how we do that from three years ago it doesn't differ that much today. We, we did make some changes to our CI and CD systems. We were using Jenkins like everyone does. Jenkins isn't great. The longer you use Jenkins, the more you're going to hate it probably. Sorry, Jenkins people. Um, we moved over to GitLab for kind of two reasons. One is, um, as a security company, we obviously have some requirements. We wanted to bring our code in-house. And also, GitLab's kind of CI and CD system is pretty nice. Uh, and, and we just really haven't looked back. It was, it was great. But most importantly, we ship code when it's ready, which I'll talk a little more about what that means. So we build this deployment pipeline, very simple. We compile source code. We build a package. Uh, we're a Ubuntu shop, so we build Debian packages. Uh, we sign the package, we test the package, and then we deploy it, right? This is what you all should be doing. There's one important point, though, that people kind of miss out on, which is signing the package. Um, again, we're a security company, and people often are like, well, you're a security company. Like, you have to sign your packages. It's like, no. Like, when you sign that package, and then you test a signed package, and then you deploy that package, you can confirm the code that you're deploying is the exact same code that you tested, right? Uh, depending on the kind of programming language you're using, maybe if it's not a compiled language, can an engineer kind of slip a change in there after test, uh, and now the package being deployed is different than the one that was tested? So um, it's ensuring the integrity of software as it moves through the pipeline. And also, you don't want an attacker gets access to some part of this pipeline also slipping in some code. This is how you can confirm that's, that's all working well. So what is ready for us? I said we ship code when it's ready. And at a real high level, we have these kind of three, three pieces here. It's been reviewed by other engineers. It's passed a series of unit integration and functional testing. And it's been reviewed to ensure that it meets other business or security requirements. Now, you're thinking to yourself, wow, Pete, that's really vague. Uh, it's, yes, of course it's vague. It's for our auditors. This is what we put together for our SOC 2 process. And I pulled this right from our SOC 2 documentation. But the beauty of going through a SOC 2 process, how many people actually have been through a SOC 2? If you need a hug later, I'm around. I know how it is, right? So we have a SOC 2 process we have to abide by. So um, the business requirements now live in this world where we have to tie them to our software requirements. Um, but in the initial stage, the, uh, the process of getting your software reviewed and understanding what was ready, our engineers were like freaking out. They're like, oh my god, we're gonna fail SOC 2. What if I deploy code and I didn't get it approved, right? And so we, we, you know, we had to go through and create some tools to make it really easy. Um, one of the tools we created was a tool called Sockembot. Um, you know, like little Sockembot robot things. 
So what Sockabot does is it will, on a pull request or a merge request, GitLab calls a merge request, um, it will take the code, it will look at all your commits, because every commit will have a ticket number associated with that. And then it doesn't matter if this is config management code, we use chef, uh, or application code, or whatever, it goes through every single commit and figures out what the tickets are. Then it will go to Jira, figure out if those tickets are in the correct state, and then it will basically let you know. And it'll say, hey, you're ready for merge. Um, you're SOC2 compliant. Here's the ticket numbers. They're all approved. And what's great is that in the chef world, at least, uh, all of our cookbooks are like auto versioned and stuff. You can go through and see the changes you're about to deploy to the environment. And um, it makes this process so much simpler. But if for whatever reason the tickets are not in the correct state, then you know, Clippy is going to come on and be like, hey, like, did you mean to follow SOC2? Um, Clippy has become kind of a meme inside of the company. Whenever we deprecate like an API or a tool, we just pop Clippy in there and just be like, hey, like, have you tried using this other tool that's way better? So we had to put it, Clippy in here as well. What's really neat about this is you can then see here's a series of tickets. Some are in progress, some are approved. And it's going to let you know because I might be pushing code that, that actually has some code from another ticket from another person. And so this is how we kind of take care of that. So other projects, though, can have their own setup. Um, can you really say you're doing SOC 2 if you don't have at least one Mean Girls reference? Uh, so if you haven't seen Mean Girls, you should. It's, it's a good movie, but you go, Glenn Coco. Got to put it in there. So let's talk about metrics. Um, what ThreatStack did from the really early days was make it very simple for engineers to get metrics to a destination. Um, we didn't have time when we started building out a whole time series telemetry environment. So we integrated tools. Uh, internally that we had with uh, services like Librato. Um, so we created this idea of like, if you want metrics for your apps, send the data here. And StatsD was a, a, one of those ways in which we did that. Um, so it's the ops responsibility to build the systems for that, make them easy to use, and it's the devs responsibility to instrument their application, because they're the ones that are get paid for it. And so instrumenting their application as like that first step uh, was really important. So. You know, our setup right now looks pretty similar to this, where we use Collect-D. Uh, we're all Linux, which is great. We, uh, we can run Collect-D everywhere. There's a StatsD plugin. Developers know if I want a metric, I send it to localhost 8125, and that data will go wherever it's got to go. Um, the beauty is, is because we standardized on the API that the developers would send to, when we moved from Labrado uh, uh, to our own on-premise infrastructure. Um, one of the downsides of hosted services, they get very expensive as you scale up, and we're doing something like 60,000 metrics per second. So whenever SignalFX calls me or Datadog, and they're like, hey, buy my metrics thing, and I'm like, it would cost me, like, I don't know, $50,000 a month, like, I'm good. So uh, when we made the change from hosted to on-prem, all we had to do is change where Collecti wrote to. And for a while, we actually wrote to two locations. Um, we wrote to the uh, Labrado location. We wrote to the new place and did a lot of testing from that perspective. So it is up to both the devs and the ops teams to work together to ensure we're using the right instance type for workloads. Um, we could just let them run whatever instance site they want. We're all on Amazon. But in my experience, that's going to lead to a world where engineers are just going to run the largest instances possible. I, I can't tell you how many times people are like, oh, man, I need that X1 instance for like caching this thing in memory. And I'm like, no, you don't. You need a T2 medium. Go back to work. Um, they'll just run the biggest things because they're like, oh, but, but we're on the JVM. It's like, OK. But I'm looking at your graphs, and you're not even barely using any of this, this, this resource. So I'm going to just change it in the background. Now, a lot of times people are like, I know. I'm going to run Kubernetes. Because then the devs will just define in their app how much memory and CPU it needs. And if you're thinking to yourself that that's going to solve your problems when it comes to instance sizing, uh, and that engineers are just going to magically pick the right amount of CPU and memory, um, then it's going to be the same scenario. Like They're just going to basically massively over-provision. So you'll always have this problem that you have to solve. So how do we know that this is working? Um, we know it's working because our engineers spend part of the deployment process building out the dashboards. So the only way you can deploy an app at ThreatStack is to have uh, a series of kind of pre-flight checklists completed. And one of those things are links to your dashboards, as well as when alerts fire, they should be linking to runbooks, right? How do I debug this thing? Where are the logs? How does this thing work? Um, and 
we have developers creating these great dashboards for all their services. Things change, they can do a deploy, they can dark ship a feature, and they get incentivized to create good dashboards, to create good run books, because again, they are gonna get paged when an issue happens. And if they're not directly getting paged, they're gonna get escalated to if the on-call person's like, I don't know how to restart this thing because there's no run book on it, there's no documentation, uh, they start getting incentivized to actually improve that stuff. So what about ownership and accountability? Um, the operations team, kind of owns the infrastructure, and that's kind of a really broad term. And I've seen a lot of scenarios where just infrastructure is owned by everyone, which is usually code for infrastructure is owned by no one. Um, as operators, we, we have to ensure that the company is making the right choices for scalability, availability, and cost. It is, in a perfect world, my engineers would know all of these things, and how does your application fail, and how do you make sure it's deployed correctly? But we have to spend a lot of time training and teaching them and making them feel like they understand the trade-offs they're making with their app. And so um, we spend time more often training than actually doing a lot of these other things on the operations side. So the developers, though, they own their applications. They own the performance of the application and the availability of that application. They get paged when the application runs into problems, and they'll manage the whole life of the service, all the way from the idea to deployment to scaling all the way down. They write the run books, they write if there's code for auto deployment. We have abstracted away how their service gets deployed, and we teach them how to use tools that will deploy their application, but they're the ones that are gonna own it and and having, like I said, monitoring, having some of the other, um, the easy ways to deploy software that we built early uh, makes it simple for them to really kind of manage this all the way through. But at the end of the day, we all care about the health of threat stack. We all care about the overall platform because it's, it's, a, it's a large platform consuming insane amounts of data and the failure of any one component could be the failure of the whole thing, depending on what the service is and how you're talking to it. It's just a large distributed system, and these are hard, hard things to run. So we all have to care about it. We all have to uh, kind of move the ball forward from there. So how do we do DevOps, right? Ops has to trust that dev people are going to involve them on feature discussions. So there's nothing worse than devs being like, and I've had this happen in my past where it's like, hey, we just wrote this brand new awesome service and it uses Kafka. Like, can you just spin me up a Kafka? It's like, we don't, not only do we not have Kafka, we don't have Zookeeper or any of the dependencies. So like, when do you want this by? Oh, we're deploying it tomorrow. Are you ready? It's like, no, right? So you have to, you know, ensure and, and, and involve on that side. And so on the other side though, on the operations, we'll make changes to the infrastructure. You know, if you want to roll in Kubernetes, like that's awesome. But you know, if your engineers are not building stuff inside of Docker containers or or are building it in a way that it could even be run in, in kind of a stateless way, then they're gonna basically sit back and be like, what, "What's going on? You just completely changed how we run all this stuff." But at the end of the day, everyone has to trust that everyone is doing the best for the business, right? So, what about DevOpsSec, like the mission or DevSecOps, right? Or Sec DevOps? Was it Ops DevSec? I just, I'm losing track at this point. So it's like, every time I see stuff like this, I'm just like, yeah, like, oh, the, like, just the magic that you'll get, right? We did, we saw a lot of that with DevOps and DevSecOps and whatever. Words are words. Words, in a lot of ways, like, just take, you can't take them at face value that, you know, deploy this DevSecOps tool and suddenly you'll have DevSecOps magic, right? We know that doesn't work. You have to think about it more holistically. Um, my biggest beef with a lot of these terms is that if you ask 10 people, like, what does DevOps mean, you're going to get about 15 responses. I'm not confident us as a community is able to actually define what some of these new words mean. I often say, just have your security teams basically doing DevOps, right? Tie them into the same process as the rest of the team's doing, and just call it DevOps, right? You're, you're not calling it DevSec QA ops or whatever, like, your QA team's involved in, in the DevOps kind of process, so why, why, would, why would we treat security any differently? At the end of the day, though, integrating this stuff in, this is hard work. Um, our, our security engineers at ThreatStack, they do more ops than most ops teams do. And uh, I say the same thing about our dev team. Our dev team does more ops than most ops teams do. Um, so does that mean that we do DevSecOps? I, I don't really know. Um, but our kind of internal SecOps program and how we manage uh, the security uh, of our entire systems was very impactful for how we were able to get through our SOC 2 last year with zero exceptions. 
Um, and, and none of it actually slowed the business down. There wasn't one developer that said, I can't deploy when I want to deploy because security processes are slowing me down. Security built tools, and they built servers that developers would consume. It's much like a service business, where they're building the tools that everyone else consoles, consumes. Ops builds the tools that other teams consume. It's the same thing. So how do you integrate security? And I say it's the exact same as integrating in your dev and your ops teams that we did years ago with DevOps, or maybe you're even doing that today. So bring your security teams into the mix, right? Leveraging your shared tools and processes. If you have these awesome CI and CD build systems, like show your security teams how that works. They would love to tie in like maybe some like static code analysis into your build process, or maybe they can do some vulnerability scanning as part of dev or QA. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not that they don't want to help or they want to slow you down, is you got to remember that they're on the hook for when you get hacked, right? Who's going to get fired when you get hacked? It's not going to be the dev person running vulnerable software. It's going to be the security team that is, is charged with making that safe. Um, show them how the tools work. At a previous company, I taught our security teams how to use configuration management because they were like, hey, we want to deploy you know, this tool, like OS query out to a bunch of servers. Like, how do we do that? I'm like, yeah, like, check it out. Like, here's our, here's our you know, chef cookbooks, and here's where you got to go, and here's how you test it, and here's how you deploy it. And then after that, they started building all these security tools with the config management. They weren't blocking any other team. They weren't asking for, they just went and did it, right? Um, one advantage of working at a security company is we get to use ThreatStack to protect ThreatStack. Um, and our security team uses ThreatStack. We have all our environments basically um, sending data into kind of a, a dedicated ThreatStack that we use for that. And we, we can use it to ensure compliance and, and kind of identify threats in our environment. But you don't just run it and like magic happens, right? We all want to wish that. But you want to make security visible. And we even integrate our security alerting into like public Slack channels. So you can always go into a Slack channel and just see the alerts that are happening. Um, and it gives a place for people to go and say, like, you know, oh, I was doing some changes. So we have some CloudTrail events uh, coming in through Slack. And it's just like, hey, yeah, that was me. I was rolling, rolling some infrastructure. Um, now, some people would say, like, oh, well, why are you even getting alerted? That's a normal operation. It's like, well, it's a normal operation that we don't do very often. So like, I kind of want the alert. But in the future, we want to do stuff like tie into Slack so that like, if an alert gets fired, the, the person who, who kind of caused the alert, if they were doing a deployment or something, could just say, like, yeah, that was me. Like, click yes. And then that gives a lot more insight to the security teams to understand what's going on. So this is one of my favorite quotes in general, um, you know, but it's, it's got a little more of a security twist to it, which is, abrasive individuals will single-handedly do more to undermine the security brand uh, and culture at your company than anything else. It's true, obviously, for all parts of the business. If you don't have an approachable security team, it's not that the bad things won't happen. It's just no one's going to tell you when it does. Um, our security team holds open office hours where they will just sit down and say, come and ask us questions about whatever. It doesn't matter. About email security, about uh, I'm traveling and how do I stay secure when I travel. Uh, and they'll just, it doesn't have anything to do with just like, oh, I, I clicked on an email with a link or something like that. But the best security cultures are collaborative. They're not prescriptive. And it's easy for me to say this, that, you know, oh, just like, you know, like I said, just do the DevSecOps, right? But at the end of the day, it requires a lot of work from a dedicated group of people. Um, and those people have to want the thing to be better than it currently is. You often hear, and I think uh, when Andrew Schaefer talked last year here, he, you know, he always says, like, people always ask me, like, what's the secret of DevOps? And they get disappointed when I tell them that it's chopping wood and carry water, right? We started from a, essentially a greenfield world of 10 servers on Amazon consuming like a few thousand events per day to many, many, many systems on Amazon consuming millions of events per second. Um, we're, we're definitely not, you know, some legacy enterprise, whatever. It still took us four years to get to this point, right? There is no quick answers to this. If you want to improve how your business gets work done, how your technology moves forward, you have to realize, again, it's hard work over long periods of time. Um, and for us, it took four years. People look at Netflix as my favorite example. Oh, Netflix is this unicorn, and look how they do cloud. They, it took them something like 15 years to shut down their data centers, right? It's going to take you more than a year. You can't just build up a DevOps team and just say, we're doing DevOps now, right? It takes a long time and a lot of work over a long period of time. The goal is to just make continual progress. Just make everything just a little bit better, a little bit better today, a little bit better tomorrow, 
little bit by little bit. Thank you very much.